the catacombic machine. I'm Joseph. Welcome. Today, I'll talk to one of my favorite conversation partners and fellow Swede, Alexander Bard. Alexander, as you might know, has been on the show before, talking about his and Jan Sirkvist's fourth book, Synthism Creating God in the Internet Age. Their previous three books make up the Futurica trilogy, and as you will hear in this episode, they're currently writing a fifth book. If you enjoy listening to The Catacombic Machine, then please consider supporting this project on Patreon at patreon.com slash machine and make sure the show continues after the imminent summer break. Now, let's listen to Alexander Bard. Enjoy. I want to start with something that Deleuze says. He speaks about a third draw beyond theism and atheism, where the forces of man has entered into relation with other forces in such a way that they make up something else which will no longer be either God or man. Or we could say it's a third draw beyond representational logic. You often speak about the death of man in terms of the end of the individual. I think this is something that people have a hard time not only accepting but actually understanding what it means so we can start off with you explaining that you got a lecture uh actually a horrible tedx they're called what if the internet is god that i did a couple of years ago and it basically addresses the question uh what if we start looking at the world rather as one huge computer to which uh, over seven billion very confused bodies are connected And that's exactly the kind of society we already live in. The internet now is one huge computer that covers the entire planet. What John Sedekvist and I, in our prophetic book, The Global Empire, calls the global empire. You know, the this is a new empire and it's global in scope and it's called the internet and we can no longer get away from it. This is something that didn't even exist 30 years ago, so it's clearly a revolution. I mean, if this is not a revolution, I don't know what is. Then we look at the world as this global empire this one huge computer and we're all connected to it and we're all slaves to it. And, and that's the way I see it, rather than the less sort of like idea that man and God would somehow merge with each other. In the new fifth book I'm working on right now with John Sedeckvist, it's a very Freudian book and I think we're, we're going against the less and defending Freud and Lacan against him and looking at man in a much more ruthless way. I, I'm not sure I read the less that way, actually. I think the less says before we had a representational logic where we tried to represent the world the way an omniscient god would see it and then you had man with universal reason and this is a move beyond that well the loose in anti oedipus is a lot softer on human beings i think than lacan was and i'm a laconian myself just like chao jishik and, and i don't think the really he really doesn't succeed, although he fails in an interesting way, which is what philosophy often is. It's interesting failures. Lewis is magnificent still. He's interesting, but I, I react against the softer approach towards man's role in all of this. I mean, I am I'm not only a post-individualist, but also aggressively anti, anti-humanist in a very Nietzsche in way. Uh, and what is interesting is rather what replaces man. You mentioned Nietzsche, and of course I know you enjoy reading Nietzsche, and he, he talks about free will as something that we don't even understand what that would even mean nowadays, and he wrote that quite a while ago. So in this global empire that you speak of, and you have still human beings, you say that we're enslaved by it. Are we totally determined to act in certain ways. Well, uh, John Sedeckis and I completely slaughtered the concept of freedom, uh, essentially because will and freedom have nothing to do with each other. We might have, or at least perceive that we have free choices. And there are choices given to us that either through chance or by some kind of weird, um, um, you know, emotion or will at the moment, things are going one direction or the other. So freedom can be tied in choice, and you can still be sort of intellectually honest about it, the will cannot be separated from itself. In what way would it then be free? I mean, will is just a force of some kind that, that seems at least to desire to go in a certain direction. Or that drive, which Lacan does, we could also call it instinct, which John Sedeckvist and I happily do in our new book. 
I'm going to speak about a fourth category in the system of drive called transcendence coming out next year. So, so we want to explore Lacan further and go deeper into Lacanian psychoanalysis to discuss what kind of wills there are. Um, these wills are different from one another. They have different origins. They have different goals. They operate in different ways. Sometimes they operate consciously. Very often they operate subconsciously, um, depending on how, how enlightened we are about our, our drives and desires. But what's important here is to never add the, the term freedom to the will, because free will to me is a strictly Christian concept. Free will was, was, free will was essentially introduced as a concept in, in feudalist society. I'm saying feudalist, not feudal. In feudalist society, free will was introduced. So, for example, that the pharaoh could hold the citizens of Egypt responsible for their actions. If you say that will can either be free or not free, and you say it is free, well, then you just claim if people love that idea. So they say, yeah, I have free will. I'm a human being with free will. Well, you can immediately hold that person responsible for that person's thoughts, words, and for that person's actions. Yeah. The holding responsible for, for all those three things, you can take them to court and you can lock them up if they don't do what you like. That's exactly how you control a society. That's what the law is based on. So the law is based on a false assumption of free will. And, and I'm interested in wills. I never, ever would discuss them as be, being free or not. For me, this connects with my previous question with the God and man question, because I think this is what Spinoza calls the theological illusion, which is connected to how we confuse effects on the body as final causes of our own actions, so that we perceive ourselves to be free to act. Ultimately, we, we can't imagine ourselves being the cause of everything, so we create the theological illusion in order to explain what we cannot explain being our own doing. That is true, but Spinoza is discussing a human being who has already been fostered within the Judeo-Christian paradigm. Yes, this is, this is a critique against Descartes. It is perfectly, it's perfectly possible to be a human being outside of the Judeo-Christian paradigm, in which case you don't have to buy into any of this at all. So uh, this is exactly why I, in my studies, okay, I, I think Spinoza is brilliant. He's wrong on some things, but he's basically brilliant. The big break in Western philosophy was Spinoza. Without Spinoza, we'd never had a Hegel or a Nietzsche. I add Hegel to it, but otherwise Deleuze and I have the same favorites. Uh, Spinoza's big break is really interesting because of his cultural history. Spinoza was of Portuguese or Spanish origin, Jewish. So that would be like Arab Jewish origin originally. That means he'd be influenced by the Sufis in Morocco. But the Sufis in Morocco were the scholars of Iberia at the time. And the Moroccan Sufis were incredibly inspired not only by Islam, but certainly by Zoroastrian. You can trace the Zoroastrian thinking throughout Islam all the way back to when Iranian and Arabic culture met. And, and from then on, you have Shia Islam, but you have more than anything, you have Sufi Islam culture. So wherever Sufism pops up, you should think of it more as a Zoroastrianism disguised as Islam. It can be folk Islam in some cases, but it has a strong original Zoroastrian element. It's absolutely clear to me that if you're a proper so Sufi scholar, especially one who would have trained Spinoza before he started his, to Western ears, very original thinking, he'd be very inspired by Sufi thought. So... You could claim that Spinoza indirectly is a Zoroastrian. The same way you can claim that Jesus Christ was indirectly Zoroastrian. The same thing goes for Spinoza. I mean, his, his great work is called Ethics. He was interested in ethics as opposed to moralism. That is, that is the break with Judeo Christian thing. This is why I wanted to trace this all the way back. And I studied ancient Persian for eight years, eventually converted in the early 1990s and became a Zoroastrian. So my religious, my original religious home is within Zoroastrian. Now, what's interesting is Zoroaster's original take, not so much that he's superior to Spinoza, but it's rather that Zoroaster is not corrupted yet by what I call the Abrahamic paradigm. That means when Zoroaster existed 17, well, that would be the 18 centuries before Christ. So that would be 3,700 years ago. That's when Zoroaster was active. And in the Gothas, Zoroaster discusses a, a worldview which is completely ethical. It has no morality at all. And that's exactly what Nietzsche and Hegel were so inspired by and way later. Nietzsche even named his most famous book after this character, Archisprax Zarathustra. So Thoraster claims that 
Ethics is interesting, morality is not. And he does this simply by removing the idea of the supernatural. So if, if you take the supernatural out of your worldview, and you regard everything as being natural, meaning everything belonging to the same universe, and this universe being univocal, being only one universe, possibly even saying that the only thing that is one, the universe, is the universe itself. Everything else is split into infinite multiplicities, except for the universe itself. This is an idea we recognize from Alfred North Whitehead in the 20th century. It actually existed already around 3,700 years ago. That's incredibly, incredibly important. So Sorastor thinks so brightly simply because there is no Abrahamic religion yet. He's not influenced by Pharaonic Egypt. He's not influenced by Babylon, by any of the feudalist river valley cultures with their strong kings. So the, the Iranian heartland, the Iranian highlands, 3,700 years ago, was a, was a much more decentralized society than Egypt or Babylon. It was perfectly feasible. I think this was a society that didn't give priority to the afterlife. The Iranians were just as cultured as the Egyptians and the Babylonians, but they never built pyramids. That, that speaks volumes about how their worldview was different from the Egyptian world. And it's a process movement that changes primary within one universe that wasn't fixed. And if you look at it that way, you then can take human values, what we value in life, and, and simplify it by saying what we value in life is simply down to cause, effect, and chance. Chance playing a minor role, but an important role. The rest is cause and effect. And that means what Zoroaster said was that it, just imagine how you think, and then imagine how your thinking influences what you speak. And then imagine how your speaking influences how you act. And you realize that one thing uh, is interwoven with the next one, meaning also that your actions will influence your thinking. And the only active agency you have as a human being is this tiny, tiny influence you have in, in, you know, in, in, into the future, looking into the future, and influencing this process. Meaning that when something happens, there's no free will at all. When something happens, you're bound to act in a certain way. But if you're preparing yourself for it, if you're educating yourself for it, if you're learning about the world around you, if you become more enlightened, you will make wiser decisions when the chance is given. And this is exactly what pure ethics is. This is an ethics without moralism. And that's exactly what Zoroastrianism has been a religion for 3,700 years that doesn't have any commandments at all. It doesn't need them. And your identity, your identity is... What you think, what you say, what you act. You have to identify with those things. That is who you are. This is what I want to get to, because the emphasis, the modern emphasis on the individual still hold on to a kind of transcendence of the Cartesian ego, the universal reason. And this is, I think, something that you, in your work with Jan, challenge with the global empire because suddenly we live in a world where this old way of thinking about ourselves isn't working any longer. So rather than talking about individuals, you're talking about individuals. Our work really starts with the first chapter of the book, The Netocrats. The title of the chapter is Technology is the Driving Force of History. This is to take Nietzsche seriously. It is to understand that um, first, there is technological disruption around us. Our environment is, is identical from one day to the next. We are identical from one day to the next because as human beings, ever since civilization began, we have not changed. We might change in the future, you know, but we might, we might influence our genes more, more you know, drastically than we've done so far. But basically, we, we give birth to children, we raise these children, they take over and they're the next generation and then the whole thing goes on. The only thing that has really changed over the past 5,000 years is civil, in civilization has been technology. We always overrate our own role, our own conscious role in this machinery. When in reality, all we do is that we try to adapt to technological change. And that's exactly why in our philosophy, in our way of writing history, we discuss four different paradigms, which is first there was spoken language made us different from the other animals. Then we had written language for a few thousand years. Then we had printed and mass distributed language over the last 600 years. And now we've got interactive language with the internet. So history just speeds up even more by there's more and more technological disruption, making it harder and harder for us to adapt to these technologies. Those who do so successfully will always win. Essentially, you can read the Netocrats as a kind of a modern self-help book for people who are tired of self-help books. 
where did individualism come from and why? Why was that meme so successful? But we're saying essentially that with Descartes invented in 1637, with I think, therefore I am, was an idea that needed to be developed between the printing press in 1450 and the French Revolution in 1789. The French Revolution could not have happened in 1789 unless there was this new idea of a supreme individual, the citoyen in France, the, the new citizen, with the citizen's rights and possibly also responsibilities as superior to any god. And the way Descartes did it wasn't that he killed God. That whole process really takes off with Nietzsche in the 19th century. It's perfectly okay to credit Nietzsche with killing God, but Descartes didn't really need to kill God. What he and his friend Isaac Newton needed to do to invent individualism and to invent atomism, which is the basis for natural science, was to put God to sleep. In 1637, God is being put to sleep. And this kick starts the Enlightenment in, in Europe. And by putting God to sleep and saying, everything's perfect, God's done his work, he's tired, he retired, he's no longer here, means we're left alone. That means the changes we see around us are a result of our thinking, a result of our brilliant ideas, our behavior. And Descartes places this new superior God inside his own head in a gland, and that's the individual. And, and this individualism has worked wonderfully. It, its different forms have been atomism in science, been nationalism when it comes to organizing the tribe, capitalism when it comes to organizing communication flows and trade in society, it is enormous wealth. And of course, because it has been successful for 400 years, people now assume that it's an axiom. They assume this is what we always live. They assume that this is some kind of an eternal truth. And that's why everybody in our society seems to hang on to individualism. And even the critics of individualism still defend it. They might defend it less. But what John Sardekvist and I are saying in our books is that we need a complete break with individualism. We need to restart and rethink metaphysics. If we're going to restart and rethink metaphysics now, we have the internet and we have the amazing world of quantum physics to do it. Because quantum physics attacks atomism within science. And the internet attacks the idea of the individual as a successful formula in society. I mean, what does an individual do online? Well, he writes a newsletter about himself and posts it once a week. He posts a selfie on Instagram, you know, showing himself narcissistic, like, look at me, I'm great. What do we do with all this communication? We're drowned in with people who are so We throw it in the spam box. We hate it. It's dysfunctional. It no longer works. We're looking for is instead people who provide us with platforms on which we can socially network to create amazing things together. And that to me is the beginning of a true network society where we are individuals and not individuals. And connected to this, I think in, in, in the Global Empire book, you, you talk about three different types of nihilisms. You talk about the sort of Nietzschean overman as being an affirmative nihilist and the individual is not the individual is rather a cynical nihilist. Absolutely. The most common misunderstanding about Nietzsche is, is people don't understand the difference in German between Obermensch and Übermensch. It should have been transhuman originally. But these days, transhuman has been kidnapped by the transhumanist movement. It's just another form of desperate Cartesian artistic individualism, just the Elon Musk version of it. So we're still stuck with the Cartesian paradigm if we translate to transhuman. So but, but what Nietzsche meant in the 19th century was a transhuman in, in the most profound sense. A human identity that has a much wider scope than the individual has. It understands itself as interacting with its surroundings in an almost Heideggerian way. And this, this interactive creature that constantly interacts with, with a constantly changing environment around itself identifies with these surroundings and then looks at the resources it has to fulfill whatever wishes and needs it has. And that is where Nietzsche meets Lacan in our work. I mean, we're both Nietzschean and we're Lacanian. I think Lacan was an amazing Nietzschean. I think it's somewhere between these two guys, between Nietzsche and Lacan, we need to work today try to understand the world we live in. The, the global empire, I think that's something that we need to, to address as well. You mentioned it, and as I said, it, that's your second book in the Futurica trilogy. And I think, you know, personally, it's the best book you, you've written. 
the the two of you. Well, then I've got good news for you. That's the book that inspires us for the fifth one. Ah, uh, nice. But so so talk about the global empire because we've lived in a in a world where we've taken, as you said, the individual for granted, but also the nation state. And of course, people would know that there is a fierce opposition towards globalism today. More and more nationalisms. Uh, popping up everywhere, but you, but you th- think there will be a global empire, and that the internet is is the technology that made that possible. I think the global empire already exists. I think we just haven't realized it yet because you cannot disclose yourself from the internet, exclude yourself from it, still have the benefits that it provides. To be part of the benefits that it provides to you, both on an individual basis, the fact that we spend eight or nine hours a day staring at smartphones, and laptops, means that we're hooked. But but also we're hooked as communities as well. And you know if you, if if you have for example if an internet addiction problem in 2017, then then you go online, you start a Facebook forum about internet addiction. <laughs> it's the only way you can handle it. So we are trapped. That's Facebook. Yes, but you you also talk about you know some of the more pressing issues like you know the environmental crisis, terrorism, and that sort of thing, uh, and that we need sort of a global power elite to control those types of of problems because we can't do it on a national level. Well, it's interesting. Um, The most interesting experiment, although it's almost evil, even I would say it's almost evil, the most interesting experiment today with data flows actually occurs in China. Now, imagine you're part of the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party. You know perfectly well in 2017, the wealth level in China has now reached exactly that level where Japan and Korea previously became democracies. So people went out in the streets in neighboring cultures and they demanded democracy and they got it. So they got multi-party democracy. Korea, of course, did this in the 1980s. Now, the wealth level in China is on a par with South Korea in 1986. So this is very likely to happen soon in China too, unless the Chinese Communist Party can come up with some kind of strategy that would actually improve on democracy. So it would be something that is superior to multi-party democracy and can be presented as such. Now, what would you possibly do then if you said in China today you were kind of clever? This is interesting. China has two major thought traditions. One of them is Confucianism, which was resurrected in the 1970s under Deng Xiaoping. And Confucian thinking has been the dominant mode of thinking after Mao. So it's like, okay, let's pretend uh, Marx and Lenin and Stalin and Mao never existed. We go back to Confucius and we just give it a communist flag. That's essentially been China for the past 30 or 40 years. But China also has another incredibly strong thought pattern, and that goes within Taoism and Chinese Buddhism. So let's call it a Taoist uh, tradition. Now, Taoism, obviously, is the Chinese equivalent of process philosophy in the West. You, you, want, to, you want to stick your head into Alfred North Whitehead, you know, what you do it is, is go back to Li Tzu and, and, and the foundation of Taoism in China. And if I hadn't converted to Zoroastrianism, which is an Iranian origin, I would have converted to Taoism in China because it's one of my absolute favorite schools of thought. And then there is there is a lot of conversation between Whiteheadians in Europe and America and Taoists in China. Well, in the last year, over 19 academic institutions have opened Whitehead departments in China. Yeah. You might not even know about this, but why this sudden interest in Whitehead in China? Well, of course, what the Chinese want to do is to resurrect Taoist school of thought, see if they can incorporate the power of Taoism within the current Chinese culture, contemporary Chinese society, and see if that could be a route to surpass democracy, keep the Communist Party in its place, simply develop methods of arranging data flows to find out what Chinese citizens want so you can reach those citizens, give them what they want before they go into the streets. So it's, it's like a nightmare where sort of Palantir, you know, the, 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 the secret private CIA of Silicon Valley, meets the Chinese communist fantasy of keeping the communist party in power in China. Yeah. And what does the Chinese communist party want to do ultimately is access to their minds, know what they want, and give them what they desire before they even know it. The Communist Party can be seen as providing this. And if, if not the Communist Party, then certainly Alibaba or Tencent or some other huge Chinese company providing, providing this to citizens in China, they would never ask for it. This is, this is incredibly interesting. Even if the Chinese fail, they're on to something. 
And if I would look at where are we heading post-democracy, where are we going to go next? I wouldn't look to society that's gotten used to democracy. I'd rather look at somebody who's so desperate they want to get around it. And certainly that's what the Chinese are. You know, they're not like Indians. In India, they have democracy. In Europe, we have democracy. In America, we have it. Whether we like it or not, we do have some kind of democracy and multi-party rule. And we have different institutions that compete for power. You do not have that in China. So, so the Chinese would be most keen on finding out what people have inside their brains and then try to meet that by providing some kind of a service society, political service to people. So they, that will keep the population in its place. And, and this, this, is, this is the global empire in its first form. This, this would be, to me, is having access to people's minds through the data flows. It's something we didn't even write about in the book, The Global Empire. We wrote that book 14 years ago. It was impossible to foresee this 14 years ago. Honestly, it really was. But I could definitely see how we developed this in the new book, and I could definitely see how this is now being developed in lots of places around the world today. It's like, how far can we go in accessing people's minds to find out what they want? I mean, Google Maps is desperately trying to do this by telling us every day, that you want to do this now, and then you want to do this, and then you want to do this. And people are shocked to find out that Google Maps knows better what they want than they want themselves. It's really killing free will. Yeah, every time I go to my car, my phone tells me how long time it will take to drive to the city. And that's just the beginning. That's just the beginning. You realize from that experience that this phone is going to tell you a lot more about what you want. We're moving into this kind of society. This, for me, is interesting, post-democratic. This is interesting for me to explore what a global empire could really look like. But I think the global empire in its more foundational sense it's the internet protocol, which has not been democratically you know, chosen or anything. It's just there suddenly. And, and, and the internet has taken over the world. And, and I like to make things simple to start with. Have a couple of simple axioms to start with, and then you can make really brilliant, complex philosophy based on that. So if the netocrats, our first book and the first chapter, technology is the driving force of history, the foundation for my philosophy on Sodicus, that means we assume that technology is the, is the variable, human beings are the constant, at least so far in history. Okay. From that very easy assumption, you can then make a very complex philosophy that gets it right. And the same thing goes here. If you look at the back sleeve of the global empire, it says that three things here. We have planet Earth. Oh, okay. Elon Musk wants to go to Mars. He will not succeed. My response to Elon Musk's uh, attempts to go to Mars is that, why don't you just go to Siberia instead? It, it, it's, it's warmer. It has less radiation and nobody's there. You'll have it to yourself. Yeah, we have plenty of room in Sweden as well. We have plenty of room on this planet. There's less human beings around 100 years from now than we have now. So why would we leave this planet? I think Heidegger's idea that when we first saw the planet from the outside in the late 1950s, we sort of fell in love with it. We got Gaia worship. But we really did in a profound sense understand that this is the limitation of human existence. So we can start there. So you take planet Earth. Then next to take the internet. The internet is the idea that we not only look at physics as everything is being interconnected to everything else, and relations are even prior to objects. That is relationalism, that is quantum physics, that Whitehead's philosophy. No, now we have a technology that implements that. We have a technology that connects absolutely everything to the extent that the connections themselves are more important than the objects that are being connected. That's the internet of things. Okay, you just take the Internet of Things and then put it over this planet, which you literally have done. You cannot go anywhere on this planet any longer without being covered by some sort of Wi-Fi. So Internet is now literally covering the entire planet. That means you now put a fold over the entire planet. That fold is what we call the global empire. I know Google's chairman, whatever his name is, he said at the World Economic Forum in Davos when asked about the Internet and the future, and he said the Internet will go away because it will be everywhere. So so I think, you know, for some people, capitalism is still primary, but you talk about informationalism instead. So maybe you can talk about that paradigm shift and how, in a Darwinian way, new things will be rewarded. Okay, well, the blood of capitalism is capital itself, money. Yeah. So if something's going to make capitalism redundant to sort of replace it or... or sort of uh, downgraded the secondary role. 
That that is that's what the printing press did with written language. It handwritten language disappeared after hundred years of using the printing press. And we printed money and 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 we printed newspapers and we printed encyclopedias and suddenly the world changed. Um, and, and handwritten language disappeared. So we have to look at something. Is there something out there today that not only not so much replaces money as actually makes money secondary? Yeah. Do we see any flows of information out there that capital is being accumulated on a scale we've never seen before without anybody involved in trying to capitalize it? Okay, you look at Google. Uh, what does Google do? Well, they do lots of things, but the one thing they've done that's been really profitable is Google Search. We have Google Search in our computers and on our smartphones, and we use Google Search to guide ourselves through reality. So uh, we, we would like to make informed decisions. You don't make any decisions any longer unless your decision is informed. You don't go, go to shop and buy anything unless you're informed first. You don't date a person unless you're informed first. You, you don't apply for a job unless you're very informed first. We have all access to all this information. We like to be informed. So we go to Google search because the internet essentially is a chaos. And we need somebody to guide us through the chaos. And a search engine does this through an algorithm. So instead of hiring somebody to guide us online, which was very costly, we've already mapped, made that more or less automatic process by using an algorithm. And the algorithm, interestingly, presents us with where we want to go the most without us knowing it beforehand. And that is, of course, the place that has been approved by other users through their behavior. The algorithm of Google has to measure people's behavior online. Where do they go when they're interested in something? How long do they stay there? Do they use the various functions they're being offered? Do they recommend this website to their friends? Do they return? All of these things are measured by the algorithm. And when we then go to the Google search page, we're being offered what the algorithm presents to us. So this is where people go when they when they want to dig deeper into that concept. And then we provide a bit quality information rather than just it. If, if Google search itself literally illustrates the paradigm shift here, because Google search offers two columns. One column is the one that the algorithm presents to us. And it offers us where we should go according to other people's behavior in the past to find out something that's valuable to us. And nobody pays to be in that column. Because they're really good at what they do. They have maximum attention. Attention is credibility multiplied with awareness. And that's the foundation for a search engine algorithm. Now, the other column is called the ads. It even has a warning sign in it saying that it is an ad. That this is not something Google recommends. This is not something that comes out of our algorithm. This is just somebody desperately paid for being on this page to make you aware that they also exist. And then we look at the actual clicks, and of course, our clicks are 99% according to the algorithm recommendations, and only 1% of our clicks go to the desperate ads that are not in the algorithm. Yeah, they're like phone salespeople. You hate them. Exactly. This literally illustrates empirically, there's empirical evidence that this is a shift from capitalism to attentionalism, because we make all our decisions based on information we get from search engines, 99% of Purchase positions to begin with are, are made that way in contemporary society. And we follow the algorithm's advice and we don't push the ads, meaning marketing in traditional sense is dead, meaning you have to produce the best possible product or service. You know, you have to outcompete through quality and then let word of mouth through other people, users, tell other people that this is the best product or service within your segment. To be in this marketplace. Yeah, you can apply it on Google themselves. I mean, if I, I assure you that every morning the programmers who, who expand the Google algorithm put the term search engine into the in, into the Google search there. And if Google is not number one, if somebody else is number one and Google is still number two, number three, they have a problem. So it, 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 interestingly, this proves that Google has become the fastest growing company in history. Mm. And it's now also the biggest company we've ever seen, simply by applying this principle on itself. Let's not try to focus on making money. Let's try to focus on maximizing our attention. If you maximize the attention, the money will come your way. 
That is exactly what we define as what would kill capitalism. That that's important, and you, and then you have people who gets it and who who works with it and who serves the internet. And you call them netocrats, of course. We, I think we talked about this a little bit last time we spoke on the podcast. And then you have a huge number of people that you talk about as the consumptariat, the new underclass, and there's a need for a new ethics in this global empire because why should the netocrats not just fuck over the poor people or the people who have no attention, the people who just sits and watch porn and play poker? Well, maybe they do, but historically they haven't. And this is interesting. So uh, the upper class will have a new set of values that will give them even more power. And in the body machines we explored is we call it the ethics of interactivity. And of course, we trace it back to good old Zoroaster. So the, the, the best place to go skip morality, get rid of both Christian and post-Christian moralism, is to go to the world of pure ethics. And pure ethics was invented in Iran 3,700 years ago. Why go anywhere else? It's already there. We take pure ethics and we say that this is how the netocrats will behave online. Because if you behave this way online, you become individual, you create networks of people, you serve others, your leadership becomes what is called a pastor, pastorates. It's like you serve, you know. You don't, you don't lead by dominating. You lead by serving, finding out where people are heading and leading them there. And that's what netocrats already do. Then there's something that the platforms that are built today, like Google and, and Facebook, that's just the beginning of an autocracy. That's just the, like the old aristocracy or, or like the bourgeoisie. They're there first and they own and control the resources. And the main resources in contemporary society are the online platforms. It, they, 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 they're, they're the power bastards in our society. It's no longer Washington, D.C. that controls America. It's really Silicon Valley. You know? People are upset about power in America. They shouldn't, they shouldn't go on about Washington all the time. They should actually go and burn down Silicon Valley. But that's just the beginning. What happens next, and we're going to explore this in our new book, is that there's always a triad of power in a paradigm. Why wouldn't that happen again? In feudalist society, that triad was the aristocracy on the land, was a monarch who was the imaginary power, and it was the priesthood who were the symbolic power. There's always a real, realistic sort of power, and there's also then those imaginary power and symbolic power that reflects like yeah, yeah. right? So uh, the same thing then happened in capitalist, industrialist society, where the bourgeoisie owned the resources, as Karl Marx correctly put out. And uh, then you got the parliamentary, you know, democratic politicians. Of the modern political system on top of that, legislative, legislative power. And that's, of course, the imaginary power. When we talk about power, we used to talk about politicians. And then the symbolic power, where the university professor in the academic world replaced the church. The symbolic power is always the truth monopoly in society. Why wouldn't this be repeated again? Why wouldn't the internet society have a three other powers? In that case, what we've seen so far is the autocracy of platforms. The autocracy of resources, controlling the new resources, is what the autocracy does so far. But sooner or later, we're going to develop an imaginary autocracy as well. And after that comes a symbolic autocracy that interprets the society. So maybe on Sedekvist and I, for example, as cyber philosophers, are like early, you know, early sort of predatory examples or something like that of, of a forthcoming symbolic autocracy. Yeah, I would agree. We probably are. And we're producing a truth that people in Silicon Valley can use, you know. Yeah. At the end of the day, it's precisely in the symbolic category, the third one in the power triad, you always see people who betray the upper class. Priests, when they were wonderful, betrayed the aristocracy and the monarchs and went out to help and support the peasants that were controlled. Uh, and, and the same way, academia was the place where you explore the idea, how can we change the world, make it more fair? How can there be justice? And, you know, an academic professor is far more likely than a politician or a factory owner to try to be supportive to it. So it's always in the symbolic realm when that develops and hasn't developed yet. But when that develops, that's where you expect to find people who would be supportive of the new underclass. And where is the new underclass today? Well, they're, of course, stuck with the old metaphysics. What happened to Christianity when, when capitalism came along was that it became the religion of the underclass and not the upper class any longer. 
the people that still like, today it's just church ladies in Poland and confused people in the United States who still go to churches. So they ended up with the old monotheistic uh, metaphysics, and the same thing with individualism today. Who stays with individualism the longest? The consumptary. They have not nowhere else to go, and that's precisely why they stay the fixed worldview with nationalism. They stay with all those different institutions that were developed by the bourgeoisie, by politicians, by academics to rule the world 150 years ago are now the very institutions that the new consumptariat tried to hang on to nostalgically, which of course will fail. It will only determine their losing position even further. So it's a tragedy of huge, it's a huge, huge tragedy. And Donald Trump and Marine Le Pen and all these guys are locking them into this idea of individualism and narcissism and self-pity, which to Nietzsche is the ultimate form of individualism. Self-pity. Resentiment. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and the, and the thing is, I think, you know, even if you if you look to the people clinging on to someone like Donald Trump as if his way of doing politics, where he says that it's the Mexicans' fault, it's, it's the Muslims' fault, but the other side of the aisle, you have the Democrats, and they're doing pretty much the same thing. Exactly. Sometimes when I look at at feminism or social justice in any shape or form, it strikes me that they're fighting for rights in a world that no longer exists. Well, I, I agree completely, and I agree with Camille Poglin. And the male bashing that feminism has conducted in America is exactly the same thing as the Mexican bashing or the Muslim bashing or Arab bashing, rather. And what's interesting here is that we can always look at history. We always look for the phallus. And the phallus in the world called psychoanalysis has nothing to do with the male the phallus is simply order in chaos. Who can guide us through this? Ultimate authentic phallus is, of course, Moses leading the Israelites out of Egypt. Moses says, I'm uniting you into one tribe, the Israelite tribe, and I'm going to lead you out of Egypt, and this is where we're going to go. This is the utopia we're walking toward. This, the story about Moses and Aaron and leading you know, the Israelites out of Egypt is that's the, the authentic phallus leadership. So, um, what we don't have today, we don't see the authentic fallacy any longer because nobody can explain the complex world we live in in a way that you know even the most simple people out there can understand. So people stick to what's called fake fallacies, and that's incredibly dangerous. I mean, the ultimate fake fallacy is out of it. So what is a fake fallacy? A fake fallacy is somebody pretending to be a fake fallacy, but who only unites us not by leading us towards you talk like you know good old religion did, but rather unites us by hating. And this is what Julia Kristeva, in her brilliant work, calls the abject. The, the original abject is, is when the child at one year of age is tempted by the phallus to re reject the mother's breast. And by rejecting the breast, the child realizes the mother and child are separate. The child has to separate itself from the mother, push itself away, out into the world, which the phallus is tempting the child. So the phallus is that... Instead of this sort of fairy tale world next to the, the mother's breast where you're always being served, where you don't have to do anything, where you're just a permanent slacker, this is a lie. And I want to tempt you into the real world, which is hard and tough, but so much more exciting. That's called the phallic energy. This is the energy transferred from, from the tribe. It could be from the father. It doesn't have to be, but from the tribe to the child, and understanding that there's a real world out there, and it's fascinating and interesting. It's a world where you can become autonomous. And, and this is, is the, the rejection of the mamilla at one year of age is the original objection, according to you, like Christopher, because we have to do it to survive as autonomous entities, separate from our mother. We are, as human beings, very, very keen on fi finding other objects. And, and finding objects is comfortable for us. If there's a leader suddenly like Donald Trump, he says that, well, I'll solve everything for you, and I give you nationalism back, and I give you a sense of belonging in a confused world, if you hate the Mexican and if you hate the Arab with me. And that's exactly the danger of our age. This is the danger of the 20th century, that there are not authentic fallacies out there that provide us with, for example, the synthesis utopia or creative utopia or someone we can go to be creative and unified through creativity, but rather people are providing us with the idea that if you hate this one object with me, then I will unify you. And that's a bit dangerous. And the thing is, when you look to the progressives, they wouldn't manage to be in power because they have no own wish vision. They can unify after the inauguration of Donald Trump, 
going with the pussy hats and being all united against Donald Trump. But if they would sit in a room to discuss what to do, they wouldn't unify around anything. That's exactly correct. And you've just described children rather than grown up. Yes. This is the very <laughs> yes. definition of, uh, of a child compared to grown up. And this is where I, I agree with Jordan Peterson. I agree with Camille Paglia. Uh, you know, I agree with these new voices out there that are saying that essentially the point of being a human being is to one day grow up and become an autonomous human being and then raise your own children or raise, raise your own mentees, you know, or, you know, whatever. But but you raise the next generation and then you can die in peace. That's the whole thing with being human. With Cynthiaism, the, the, the fourth book that you and Jan wrote, Cynthiaism, Creating God in the Age of the Internet, uh, you talk about, of course, this spirituality. How can we work to be better at inspiring people to be part of this? Because clearly, this is a big problem. People still cling on to these fake fallacies. So what, what can we do to make these new networks more visible? This is the thing. We pro- we're probably working on a new trilogy, me and your Sadiqism. The thing is that we wanted to put the hope out there first. And the hope is to understand historically how utopias are created and what's good about having utopias. Because without utopias, without a goal for the authentic fallacy to point towards, there can be no authentic fallacy in the first. Synthesis Creating God in the Internet Age is it, 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 a book that basically lays out the claim that utopia is possible. It's actually very possible. And if we don't turn the internet into God, then certainly IBM will with Watson or Chinese Communist Party will with their data flows or whatever. We'll have all kinds of evil gods. We certainly will have gods out there, you know, enormous powers that will control us more than we ever control them. Because that is what happens with the new interactive technology. And we see it happening already. So we want to lay out the foundation and say that we can create God for the first time in history. We call it synthesis. This is a historical, theological term for creating God. And that's why the book is called Synthesis, Creating God in the Internet Age. And we're saying that this is th- these are four different roads towards creating God in this book. And, and that's what the book is there for. I'm not going to go into the details here, but if you study the book, you find there are ways of being authentically phallic in our age, and this is how you do it. It's a handbook, this is, this is how you create religion. If you want to create a credible religion, people can turn to, which they can have as a foundation for spiritual work, and also have a foundation for the transition from childhood to adulthood, which is all that religion is about. And to one day die in peace, you know? And to do this, this is how you do it. What we then can do with the new book, the one we're working on now in Aesthetic Design, this is where we're going with Freud and said, this is what's fundamentally wrong with contemporary society. And it's sort of sort of like the idea that we do this now, we would put the hope out there first. So we want to practice what we preach by putting the book of authentic phallus out. There, we can now look at the fake phalluses and get rid of them one by one and kill them in the new book. If people want to hear more about that book, last time you were on the podcast, we talked much more about that book. We, we, we've made first a podcast on the hope, and now we can make a podcast on how miserable things are. Throwing people back to the hope. So, yeah, go back to the old podcast and you have, hear a lot more about the synthesis. Yeah. By the way, the, the synthesis movement is working very well. The synthesis is very much happening. It's now being imitated rather than copied in other places like Barcelona and Copenhagen. I'm still to see it work because it is an idea I believed in. And without my involvement personally at all, other people have made sure it happened. And it just goes to show that if you, if you co create, to create the authentic talents that we're missing, we have hope. And I think that's that's a good way to end this episode. Alexander, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Joseph, it's always a pleasure. I love your podcast and I will happily recommend it to others and it will grow over time. You're, you're prophetic in your scope. I love being on the show. I hope that you enjoy that. Alexander is, to my mind, always interesting and thought-provoking. I'm sorry about the audio, by the way. It was shit, I know. But I hope that you wasn't too disturbed by it. If you're interested in Alexander and the stuff he's up to, the books he's written, and the TED Talk, uh, TEDx Talk, and so on, I'll link to a bunch of stuff in the show notes, so check them out. And um, if you're interested in hearing more about what I think about what Alexander said and 
about some of the other ideas presented this season, you should join Patreon because when this season is over in a few weeks, I'll offer a summary and an analysis on the Patreon page. So join Patreon, patreon.com slash the catacombic machine. And if not to listen to me talking to myself, do it because you want this show to continue. Thank you for listening this time and I'll talk to you soon.